Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Authorities in Fayetteville, Arkansas say that an executive at the well-known vegan food company Beyond Meat got a taste of the real thing this week when he allegedly attacked another man in a parking lot and bit his nose. According to reports, the strange and violent situation unfolded sometime after 10 p.m. on September 17th in a parking garage near Fayetteville's Razorback Stadium. It began when 53-year-old Doug Ramsey, described online as the chief operating officer of Beyond Meat, was in his vehicle attempting to leave the parking garage after watching a college football game. As Ramsey was in the traffic lane near Gate 15, another man driving a Subaru allegedly inched his way in front of his Ford Bronco. When he did, he reportedly caused a minor collision, making slight contact with the front passenger's side tire. According to witnesses, the situation sent Ramsey into a rage, who got out of his vehicle and proceeded to punch out the back windshield of the Subaru. When the driver got out of the vehicle, Ramsey allegedly pulled him in close and started to punch him. It was during this assault that he reportedly bit the man's nose, ripping some of the flesh off at the tip. Witnesses allege that they also heard Ramsey threaten to kill the Subaru driver. The situation was finally brought to an end when occupants of both of the vehicles got out and managed to pull the two men apart. When police were called to the scene, Ramsey was placed under arrest. He is now facing charges of third-degree battery and making terroristic threats. Following the incident, Beyond Meat released a statement saying that the executive had been suspended effective immediately. At the time of this recording, Ramsey has reportedly been released on bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for October 19th. Representatives from Washington's Lakewood Police Department say that a 33-year-old woman is facing several charges this week after an alleged series of poor choices saw her get a stolen vehicle stuck in wet concrete and then flee the scene with a young child and a bottle of whiskey. According to reports, the incident began sometime either late on the night of September 19th or early on the 20th when police were called about a stolen vehicle near Edgewood Avenue Southwest and Winona Street Southwest. They arrived to find a chaotic scene. The stolen vehicle in question was a Mini Cooper, which was lodged in some freshly poured concrete where the city was in the midst of building a new roundabout. There were also several items which appeared to have been deliberately thrown into the concrete, as well as footprints leading away from the area. According to witnesses, they had watched in disbelief as a 33-year-old woman, later identified as Erica Swayze, drove through the active construction site, making it nearly 100 feet through the wet concrete before getting stuck. After apparently realizing she was unable to move any farther, Swayze had thrown several items from the vehicle, including a television and an instant pot, before grabbing her four-year-old child and a half-finished bottle of whiskey and fleeing the scene. Officers were able to catch up with the 33-year-old not far from the crime scene, at which point they placed her under arrest. They were also reportedly able to confirm that the Mini Cooper, as well as the items found abandoned at the construction site, had been stolen by Swayze from her mother's house earlier that day. According to reports, Swayze is now facing a number of charges, including driving under the influence, third-degree domestic violence, negligent driving, and hit-and-run property damage. However, authorities say that additional, more serious charges could be coming. Unfortunately, sources did not provide an estimate as to how much it will cost to repair the damage that was done to the city's construction project. Representatives from the NYPD say that they are seeking to identify a murder suspect this week after a petty argument over manners escalated into a fatal stabbing. According to reports, the situation unfolded at around 10.20 p.m. on September 20th when 37-year-old Jay Nunez held the door for a stranger while the pair of them were entering a smoke shop in Brooklyn's Gowanus neighborhood. Problems between the two men allegedly began almost immediately when the stranger failed to thank Nunez for holding the door, and he apparently took offense. 
When Nunes confronted the man about why he didn't say thank you, he reportedly replied that he hadn't asked him to hold the door in the first place. After that, an argument began, one which continued as the two walked out of the store. While one of the smoke shop's employees reportedly tried to intervene, it was no use. Though the order of events is not exactly clear, reports allege that Nunez punched the stranger during the argument and that the man pulled out a knife. Evidently not believing that the man intended to use the weapon, sources state that Nunez taunted him, saying, quote, Stab me if you can do it. At some point, the man reportedly stabbed Nunez multiple times in the neck and abdomen. The 37-year-old then fell backward into the store in disbelief as he yelled for help. Though emergency responders soon arrived at the scene and Nunez was rushed to a local hospital, he could not be saved and later died of his injuries. In the meantime, the man with the knife fled the scene on a bike. At the time of this recording, authorities are still trying to identify the suspect. Few details have been reported about the man. However, police say that at the time of the incident, he was wearing a black sweater, white shirt and jeans and carrying a black backpack. Anyone with information is encouraged to reach out to the NYPD directly or to submit a tip through the Crime Stoppers website or hotline. Authorities in Bloomington, Indiana say that a 37-year-old man is in custody and is facing numerous charges this week after he allegedly attacked and threatened multiple people before hiding in a storm sewer facilitating an hours-long standoff. According to reports, the situation began at around 9.30 a.m. on September 20th when police received a call about a man, quote, swinging a steel rod at several individuals in Seminary Park. When officers arrived at the scene, they were told that the suspect, later identified as 37-year-old Eli Schwarzentruber, had not only threatened people with the rod. Afterwards, he had gone to a vehicle in a nearby grocery store parking lot and picked up a hatchet. When he returned, he threw the hatchet toward a group of people and then fled the scene. While canvassing the surrounding area, police stumbled across some clothing which had been left hanging on a railing near a large storm drain on 1st Street. The clothes matched those that witnesses said Schwarzentruber had been wearing. Believing that it was likely that the 37-year-old had ventured into the sewer, Officers began to yell inside for him to come out. He responded that they shouldn't try to come after him because he was armed with a rifle. Following the threat, police took cover and called in backup from the Indiana State Police SWAT team. Using maps of the sewers, they started trying to figure out where exactly Schwarzentruber was and also began removing several nearby manhole covers. Noise flash diversionary devices were deployed in an effort to flush Schwarzentruber out but he remained hidden as hours began to pass. Finally, the SWAT team was able to figure out where he was after using a utilities camera. He was about 500 feet into the sewer system. Though Schwarzentruber agreed to exit the system on the north end after this, he quickly doubled back and tried to flee south, destroying the utilities camera in an attempt to cover his tracks. However, he was later taken to the ground by a police dog named Loki, who was released and managed to successfully track him down. By this point, the standoff situation had been going on for roughly nine hours. While Schwarzentruber was reportedly in possession of an empty handgun at the time of his arrest, further searches of the sewers allegedly failed to turn up the rifle he claimed to have when he first threatened police. Officers were able to track down a machete and a scythe though, as well as several unfired rifle cartridges. Authorities now say that Schwarzentruber's crimes actually began before the incident at the park on the day of the standoff. According to reports, earlier that morning, he showed up at an unidentified woman's property on Kuntz Road and assaulted her. The woman told police that Schwarzentruber showed up unannounced at about 6.30 a.m. that morning and asked her to, quote, live underground with him. When she refused, he reportedly pulled out a machete and left though said that he would be back soon. The 37-year-old allegedly returned just minutes later, this time asking the woman if she was ready to go. She said he even forced his way in and started packing some of her belongings. When the woman explained that she didn't want to go to jail, Schwarzentruber's behavior reportedly grew even more erratic. 
He apparently claimed that he would bail or break her out of prison, and then said police would have to take him down because he was armed with his machete. He then allegedly attacked the woman, grabbing her by the neck and trying to kiss her, while taking his pants off and shoving money down her shirt. The woman was thankfully able to flee, and later reported what had happened to police. According to reports, Swartz and Trooper is now facing numerous charges between the two incidents, including sexual battery, residential entry breaking and entering, battery resulting in bodily injury, attempted battery with a deadly weapon, and intimidation. However, authorities also say that more charges may soon follow. Authorities in Cook County, Illinois, say that four people are dead this week, including the alleged culprit, after a man shot and killed three of his family members before barricading himself in his home, setting it on fire, and taking his own life. According to reports, the incident began at around 6.30 a.m. on September 23rd, when police were called to a residence on the 5500 block of Anne Marie Lane in the city of Oak Forest. Neighbors said that they heard gunshots coming from the home where a family of six people lived. When officers arrived at the residence, they encountered a terrifying scene. Two people were lying in the home's driveway, while a third was found on the road south of the property. All three of them had been shot. The police pulled the victims into their squad cars before rushing them to the hospital. Sadly, all of them would die from their injuries. While this was unfolding, authorities tried to deal with the suspect behind the shootings, who had barricaded himself inside the home. They managed to safely evacuate another victim before the house started to become engulfed in flames. By the time police were able to extinguish the blaze and get inside, the suspect was already dead. He was later identified as 44-year-old Carlos Gomez. The three deceased victims have since been identified as his wife, 43-year-old Lupe Gomez, and Lupe's two adult children from a previous relationship, 22-year-old Brianna and 20-year-old Emilio Rodriguez. Thanks to chilling surveillance footage taken by a camera on a neighbor's property, investigators now say they believe that they have pieced together some of the critical moments of the tragedy. According to reports, at around 6.30 a.m. on the morning of the incident, Carlos was captured on video shooting at his family members outside. The three deceased family members were hit, while one other person managed to escape. Carlos then went back inside and barricaded himself in the house before police arrived. When they did, the second survivor was evacuated while Carlos remained in the residence. It's believed that he set the house on fire before turning his gun on himself. The two surviving victims of the attack have not been identified by name, but are said to be two girls aged 15 and 13. They are reportedly the children of Carlos and Lupe and are now staying with another family member. At the time of this recording, the motivation behind the horrifying incident remains unclear. Neighbors say that the family of six had been living at the property for approximately eight years and had been having problems recently, though apparently no one believed things would end like this. The exact nature of the alleged problems the family was experiencing have not been disclosed though some reports state that arguing and screaming had been heard frequently and that police had been called to the home before. The situation is still developing. Authorities in Pinellas County, Florida say that a 23-year-old man has pleaded guilty to a felony charge this week after he was involved in a bizarre and dangerous incident last year in which he led police on a high-speed chase to impress a woman. According to reports, the situation began on the night of August 28, 2021, when a man, later identified as then 22-year-old Taylor Beverly, was observed by police in Clearwater blowing through a red light at the intersection of Chestnut Street and South Myrtle Avenue. As he did this, Beverly apparently turned around and made eye contact with officers from his white 2017 Suzuki motorcycle before speeding off. Though police attempted to make a stop, Beverly refused to pull over, continuing to fly through red lights and weave through traffic at speeds of well over 100 miles per hour. Because the chase quickly became dangerous, officers called off their pursuit, but put out a notice for other law enforcement in the area to be on the lookout. Beverly was eventually caught just before 10 p.m. that same night. 
At the time of his arrest, Beverly offered a bizarre excuse for his behavior, stating that he had been trying to show off for the female passenger who was also on his motorcycle. He said that the two of them were on a first date. It turned out that police were not the only ones who did not see the humor in the situation, though. The woman herself stated that she had been screaming at Beverly to stop throughout the chase, but that he had refused to do so. Beverly ultimately pleaded guilty to a fleeing or eluding charge, and this week was sentenced to two months in jail. In addition to the jail time, the 23-year-old's license was suspended for a year, and he was ordered to pay about $700 in court fees and fines. Apparently, this is not the first time Beverly has been in trouble with the law. In addition to prior convictions for grand theft, cocaine possession, and passing a bad check, the 23-year-old was also cited for reckless driving and driving an unregistered vehicle following a 2019 motorcycle crash. Authorities in Parker County, Texas, say that they are investigating a disturbing shooting case this week after a 12-year-old girl shot her father and herself as part of an alleged murder pact. According to reports, the incident began at around 11.30 p.m. on September 20th when police were called to a home in the city of Weatherford. When officers arrived at the scene, they found a 12-year-old girl lying in the street with an apparent gunshot wound to the head. The weapon that had inflicted the injury was reportedly found underneath her. When police went inside the residence, they found the girl's father, who was suffering from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Both of them were airlifted to a hospital, though neither of their conditions are currently known. Investigators now say that the mysterious shooting was the result of a chilling murder pact between the 12-year-old and another girl, who reportedly lives 230 miles away in the city of Lufkin. It's alleged that the girls had made plans to murder both of their families and their pets and then run away together to Georgia. After committing the killings, the 12-year-old had planned to drive to Lufkin and pick up the other girl. It's unclear exactly what happened, but it appears at some point the second girl backed out. However, police say that she has now been charged with conspiracy for allegedly helping to plan this week's incident. At the time of this recording, few other details are available about the case. It's not clear why the girls allegedly wanted to commit such heinous killings, nor is it clear how they knew each other or planned the crimes. Currently, none of the names of anyone involved in the case have been released because the girls are minors. The situation is still developing. Authorities in Athens, Georgia say that they are investigating the grisly murder of a 59-year-old woman this week whose body was found after she abruptly disappeared earlier this month. According to reports, the incident began on September 10th when 59-year-old real estate office manager Debbie Collier was reported missing by her husband Stephen. Things got even more concerning later that day when Debbie's 36-year-old daughter Amanda Bearden reported receiving a cryptic message from her mother. The message came alongside a $2,385 Venmo payment and read, quote, They are not going to let me go. Love you. There was a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. When officers spoke to Debbie's husband, Stephen, he told police that he hadn't seen his wife since the previous night when they went to sleep in their usual separate bedrooms. The following morning when he had gone to work, Debbie's van, which she had rented because her vehicle was in for repairs, was still in the driveway. However, by the time he returned that afternoon, Debbie was not home and the vehicle was no longer there. Thanks to tracking technology in the vehicle, police were able to locate Debbie's rented van. It was found off of a rural highway in Habersham County, roughly 60 miles from Debbie and Stephen's home in Athens. Sadly, the day after Debbie was reported missing, her lifeless body was found at the bottom of an embankment in a wooded area not too far from her rental car. She was nude, appeared to be clutching a tree, and had burn injuries to her abdomen. Authorities say that they found other signs of a fire in the area and that a charred blue tarp and a red tote bag were also recovered near the scene. While no cause of death has been revealed at the time of this recording, investigators say that the case is definitely a homicide. 
They further stated that so far, they have found no evidence to suggest that Debbie took her own life or that she was kidnapped. Mysteriously, it's said that when the 59-year-old last left the house, she was only carrying her driver's license and her debit card. At the current time, few other concrete details are available about the case. However, a large amount of speculation appears to be going on. Much of this surrounds Debbie's daughter Amanda, as well as her boyfriend, a former amateur MMA fighter named Andrew Geigerich. According to reports, Amanda and Andrew have both previously had trouble with the law, mostly due to domestic violence-related incidents. At least one of these incidents occurred between the two of them in 2021, when Amanda called police and claimed that Andrew had broken into her home and attacked her. Andrew was reportedly arrested and charged. However, so was Amanda for allegedly fabricating details related to the police report. What many people are most concerned about, however, has to do with a handwritten note that Andrew reportedly left for Amanda around this time, in which he stated, quote, If you or your family ever come near me again, I will hurt them. However, it's important to point out that Amanda and Andrew reportedly reconciled after this, and according to reports, are currently living together again. At the time of this recording, no suspects have been announced in the case. The situation is still developing. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching and take care.